I remember the first time I read it. It's a great verse. So first we need to, to get familiar with this strong angel whom we will meet at three important junctures of the book, all major points of transition here in chapter five. We'll see him again in chapter 10, uh, right before John eats the book. And then again in chapter seven, when we are introduced to the horror mystery Babylon. And this angel is not just any angel. He's likely part of the train of transmission that was mentioned in the first verse of the book. Remember what John said. He said that this revelation, was given to the Father to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his angel, and his angel gave it to John. When we see this angel again in chapter 10, he will have so many characteristics that remind us of Jesus that some interpreters have misunderstood him as actually being Jesus in angelic form, but that is not the case. Rather, it is his angel, it's Jesus's own sort of personal angel, and uh, much will be made of his glory and significance in chapter 10. We'll defer that conversation until we get there, but we will see this angel again, and he is actually a key figure within the narrative. I'm, the, I, I'm sorry, I missed this angel in what she read. What, what did I miss? The strong angel proclaims with a loud voice, who's worthy to, to take the book and break its seals. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Sir? In the Catholic tradition, they, they have a lot more names for angels uh, as a Protestant. Do they have a, a name for this angel? Oh, okay. This, this angel is probably Michael. Uh, that is tentative because Michael will appear later, in, uh, and he is the opponent of Satan. This angel's description in chapter 10, it seems like John has been in over backwards to contrast him with Satan. So it's likely Michael, okay. uh, but, but we, we can't be absolutely certain. We'll talk a lot about that when we get there. That, that's actually one of the centerpieces of my dissertation. So the angelic questioner of Revelation 5-2 echoes the heavenly spokesperson in Daniel 4, who is sent in strength from the Lord. These two figures carry out a similar function. The angel in Daniel speaks for the heavenly council and issues a decree of judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar which is to be followed by restoration. Daniel chapter four is such a controlling narrative for all of the book of Revelation, because it is the passage where angels of the divine council overcome the beast Nebuchadnezzar. Revelation is essentially Daniel chapter four writ large. It is a macro cosmic version of Daniel four. Well, the church as the angelic community of the saints the church as uh, those destined to be upon the divine council must again conquer the beast. And so this angel's connections back to Daniel 4, that specific story, uh, is not incidental. It's, it's triggering a narrative that will be very controlling for how we interpret the rest of the text. No one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was worthy to open the book. The first thing to note here is that it says, John began to weep terribly. And this can easily be misunderstood. Some folks think that the reason John is crying is because the book has contents about which he is interested, about which he is uh, uh, curious, and he'd really like to know what's in the book, but since it remains sealed, he just doesn't get to know, and so he is crying. Well, that's not the case. Sealing in Revelation has to do with that which will not occur, right? So, so later on, we will find that the seven thunder judgments get sealed, which means they, they don't happen. We'll find that the 144,000 get sealed, which means that the plagues don't happen to them. The reason John is crying about the book being sealed is because he knows the stuff in the book will not take place and will not transpire if it, the seals are not broken. As Lightheart said, this is not a personal lament. John weeps because the world is not yet put right, because his hope of final justice is dashed. Because as long as there is no one to open the book, then the world is not going to reach its destiny. We'll talk more about the contents of the book here in just a moment. There is a threefold search 
which probably indicates the opener has to have divine status. We are told that the reason the lamb can take the book is because he is conquered. We'll talk about this important term conquer or to conquer uh, nikao in Greek here in a moment. But usually the universe is a fourfold universe. Four is, is the number of universal spaces uh, in Revelation. It's the number of universality. It's usually heaven, the earth, the sea, and under the earth. But here uniquely, it's a threefold creation, the earth, heaven, and under the earth. Well, why is it threefold? Well, remember that three is the number that is associated with the deity, right? The book opens with a greetings from the Father, the Son, and the sevenfold Holy Spirit. So by searching the threefold universe here, this could be a hint that the only one who uh, is, is capable of taking the book is someone who has to have divine status. So what are the contents of the book and what do the scrolls on the outside of the book represent? Excuse me, the seals on the outside of the book. Uh, scholars struggle here not because it's hard to find meaning for the book, but because it's so easy to overload the book with meaning. It has a number of Old Testament connections, and as we go to those Old Testament passages and import those meanings into the, this book in Revelation, and when we look at how the book functions in Revelation, it looks like it means so many things that you get to the point where you're like, well, what does it not mean, right? Our difficulty is at finding meaning but our, our difficulty is uh, uh, abstracting a very specific definition and summary of the meaning. Uh, but I think we can be somewhat narrow, but let's consider a few Old Testament contributors to this book. One is Ezekiel. Ezekiel is commissioned as a prophet by being told to eat a scroll. Now this same book that Jesus receives in chapter five John is going to eat this book in chapter 10. So we know there are connections to Ezekiel. Now, in Ezekiel, the book represents a series of warnings. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. And as we look at the content of the book, and we look at what takes place when the seals of the book are, are broken, we can see that there are a series of woes and warnings for both the church and the world. Another important contributor is Daniel chapter 7. And this is a passage where the, the Son of Man arrives to uh, take up authority because the beasts, which represent the empires of the world, they're out of control. They're stamping around on the world as though they own the place. And so the Son of Man, like an Adam figure, comes and he receives authority over the animals. And when we compare the elements of the throne room scene in Revelation 4 and 5 to the coronation scene of the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, so many of the same elements occur and oftentimes in the same order. I'll show you what I mean. In both of these stories, the prophet looks. In both, he sees a throne in heaven with God sitting on it. God's appearance is described symbolically, but nevertheless, it's described there is fire before the throne in both texts. Myriads of myriads of heavenly beings surround the throne. We haven't met these yet in the Revelation scene, but we will here in just a moment. Books are opened. This kingdom consists of all peoples, nations, and tongues. The prophet experiences distress on account of the visions. The prophet receives wisdom concerning the vision from one of the heavenly beings. The saints are given authority to reign over a kingdom. The vision concludes with mention of God's eternal reign. So the contents of the scroll in Revelation 5 must represent the Messiah's right to reign with his people as in Daniel 7. There is one more Old Testament text which seems to be especially crucial because this is the only place in the Old Testament where a book is sealed, as this book is sealed in Revelation. 
And when John receives this book in chapter 5, and then the church divulges its contents in chapter 11, all sorts of Daniel 12 stuff is just going to start showing up. So we know that Daniel 12 is especially helpful for us. And the issue with the sealing of the book in Daniel 12 is that it can't be understood. Daniel can't understand the visions because it's sealed up. If it were unsealed, he can understand it, right? So we see the book being unsealed in Revelation to signify that these visions can be understood. Now we can know what Daniel was talking about. So let's look at some of this. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book and tell the time of the end. He goes on to say, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So the visions will be understood in the time of the end. Now, this is remarkable within the context of Revelation because it shows that the end has arrived since the first century, since Jesus took the throne. At his coronation, he takes the book, he unseals it. Chapter 10 and 11, he gives it to his church. And this is why when Revelation ends, it ends in the opposite fashion of Daniel. Daniel is told it can't be understood. It's sealed up until the end. And Revelation will conclude by saying, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation has been understandable since the first century. Based on what Jesus has done, and based on our reception of the Holy Spirit, and based on the visionary experiences of John, this book can be understood. It's always been understandable. That is the claim that the book is making. When you have popular prophecy teachers who say that John didn't understand the visions, and no Christians have been able to understand the visions, what you need is modern technology, so you can understand the mark of the beast, and you need modern politics so that you can see how all this beast stuff plays out. It's all hawkered. It's not true. Revelation is bending over backwards to tell us that this has been understandable ever since John saw the book get unsealed. This is likely how Revelation is handling this statement that in the end time, knowledge shall increase. Again, Western centric minded people have said, oh, you know, Due to the internet and technology, our knowledge is increasing. Daniel doesn't give a flip about your technology. He cares about knowledge and understanding of these visions. Daniel says in the end times, when the book is unsealed, it will be the great tribulation for God's people in the time of the shattering of the power of God's people. Well, this has been ever since the first century. This is why in Revelation 1.9, John says he's in the tribulation. And he says everybody who's in Jesus is in the tribulation and that the tribulation of God's people lasts from the time of Jesus' ascension until he comes back. This is a period of three and one half years, which Revelation does not take literally. In Revelation 12, Jesus ascends to the throne and then the three and one half years begin automatically. And they won't conclude until he comes back. So again, Every time you meet someone who talks about the final seven years or the final three and a half years, they are coming up with that because they're reading Daniel independently of Revelation. And then they're taking their understanding of Daniel and superimposing it on Revelation. That's not what you do. You look at how Revelation handles Dan Daniel's language. You look at how Revelation uses Daniel's chronological periods. He does not use them in the way that we would find intuitive and natural. He does something else. He stretches the three and one half years, the tribulation from the time of Jesus' ascension until the time he comes back. So we're in the tribulation now? Yes. And we don't know how long the three and a half years. No idea. That's why Jesus says no man knows the day or the hour. And it has been. It has been. Before since yeah. Jesus ascended. Since the ascension. Yeah, since the ascension. Continuous. The tribulation includes every person who has ever died or suffered for Jesus. It also includes uh, tribulation is not just persecution. It's also the suffering of false teaching. We'll see that in Revelation 12. That's always been around. We saw that with the church at Thyatira. And it also includes one aspect of the tribulation is becoming too complacent and comfortable with worldly success. We saw that at Laodicea. We'll see that again at Mystery Babylon. Tribulation is not just persecution. 
right? It's also the suffering of false teaching, and it's also the struggle against complacency. All of these things have been with the church since the first century. <laughs> I, <think Personally>. so. <laughs> I would say so. Everybody well, likes you not to get Okay, and you're saying that because Revelation does the more accurate job of referring back to and interpreting Daniel than the reverse. Correct. Precisely. The reverse is exactly why everybody misreads this book. People keep trying okay. to read the Old Testament on their own and then take their understanding of the Old Testament and squaring it with Revelation. But what does Revelation do? Well, Revelation reads the Old Testament for you, and it reads it in a way that you never would, right? You can't take your reading of Daniel and square it with Revelation. You have to consult with John to see how he reads Daniel, right? Our, our lens through which we view these Old Testament texts when we read Revelation has got to be the book of Revelation itself. Okay, and this is John the Elder. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know why it's John. We know he's John, but, we, okay. but there are only theories on authorship. It's not John the Apostle. Yes? This is very complicated. Sure. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is we know this based on what you're telling us right now. Are there certain steps we're, we're sh we should be doing in order to prepare? Because we can't control from beginning to end when this, <clears throat> this period will be over. We're in Never Never Land like while waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately, Revelation is trying to provide a set of instructions for how you deal with tribulation, right? When violent oppressors come, this is what you do. Uh, and we'll actually get at that here in just a moment. I is love there, that. <clears throat> is there an indication that as we get closer to the time when Jesus returns, that the church comes under more or increased persecution? Yes. Lots of lots of indications. In fact, I mean, we think of, of the Gospels where Jesus says, if those days were not shortened, in other words, if the period was not ended, then even the elect would not be spared. Uh, now, one of the things Revelation is going to try to communicate to us is one, God is not going to let the church be completely eliminated from the earth through, uh, through being put to death. And it's not going to be completely eliminated from the earth uh, through the distortions that come with bad teachings. We're not going to be killed completely away, and we're not going to be corrupted completely away. By time the second coming takes place, the church... Uh, whatever its numbers, will still exist with purity. But there will be a great falling away, and there will be a lot of people put to death. Only because of God's sovereignty. So the earth is still going to remain, and just the good people go upstairs, or go up to heaven, you know, are brought to heaven? Yeah, I mean, the earth will be remade, and then heaven will come down to the earth. And you know how you were saying, and this is just personal... And I'm sorry, I'm taking your time up. No, you're good. My son's name is Michael, and I didn't deliberately name him that from the Bible. And my grandson, his son, is named Daniel. So this is just a nice, nice, no, right, nice right. name. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, Daniel means God is judge. Hmm. Uh, Michael. I have to get back with you, oh, Michael. <laughs> um, Michael is God. So Daniel says in this final three and one half years, God's temple will de be desecrated. We'll see this imagery in Revelation 11 where this is interpreted as violence against the church throughout the church age. That's the desecration of God's temple because we are his temple. Is that physical violence? Or physical, physical violence. violence. Yeah. Physical violence. <clears throat> and then the three and one half years culminates with the resurrection of the dead a topic concerning which uh, Revelation has more to say than any other biblical book. Uh, this will be discussed later. So then, Daniel, the nature of the great tribulation is withheld from the prophet. He can't understand it. In Revelation, it is unsealed, and now we understand the nature of the great tribulation. It is a period that lasts the entire church age, and it's something that happens to us. 
which is why if you think you are raptured out of tribulation, you've missed the whole point. But never mind, we don't have to rehash all that. Where did that idea come from? For, yeah, yeah, it, it, it came from, no, 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 you're good. It, it comes from uh, uh, 1840s, uh, the Plymouth Brethren. And there, there's another, a number of things that happened there. But one of the biggest things is they started reading the Old Testament very literally, and then making the New Testament fit their reading of the Old Testament, what I was talking about earlier. That's precisely where that came from. So, Four takeaways on the sealed scroll. One, the seals of the scroll represent woes for the world and warnings from the church based on Ezekiel. Now, I think I should say this, that we have two storylines associated with this book, not one. The breaking of the seven seals, as we will see beginning next week, is its own storyline. The content of the book, which must be consumed, and then verbally expressed, that is another story. So uh, warnings and woes seems to be especially associated with the breaking of the seals, that first storyline. What about the second storyline, the actual consumption and verbal expression of the book? We can say that the contents of the scroll reveal, one, Christ's right to reign with his church based on the connections to Daniel 7. Two, the nature of the tribulation and the final judgment based on connections to Daniel 12. That's what we've been discussing. And then three, the church's obligation to witness, suffer, and pray plagues upon the world in order to save the world. That is something that we won't be able to get to until we get to chapters 10 and 11. It's kind of one of the great high points of the book. Uh, but that's a conversation that we'll have to defer until we get that. I, I can't see it because my eyes don't. Which one? Three. Three is the church's obligation to witness, suffer, and pray plagues upon the world in order to save the world. The guy with bad eyes is a different color. That's right. I actually didn't pick these colors. It kind of gave me a model, and I just went with it. Okay. Pray plagues upon the world in order to save the world. We are going to find that the trumpet judgments are very concerned with showing us how the plagues can be effective in making people repent. And it's going to tell us that plagues alone can't do it. All right, we'll, we'll get there later. So Jesus is referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Why is he called this? Well, in Genesis 49, Jacob is dying. He has his 12 sons, which are the progenitors for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says, speaks a blessing over each one as he is dying. When he gets to Judah, he gives uh, a blessing which came to be understood as a messianic prophecy. Remember that Judah is the tribe that Jesus comes from. Says so Judah... Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. So this is uh, uh, a combative, violent type prophecy that he's going to be a conqueror. Judah is a lion's whelp. A whelp is a young lion who's kind of in his prime, in his strength. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Now, by the time you get to the first century, messianism, uh, ideas about the Messiah, this was a common picture that the Messiah would be a lion. I won't read this, but there's another apocalypse that is contemporaneous with Revelation where the Messiah appears as a lion and he is speaking to the eagle who represents the Roman Empire. And the Messiah ultimately defeats the Romans, right? So this is the way people are used to thinking about the lion. And this is the kind of imagery that's being invoked when he hears about the lion who's conquered military imagery, violent imagery. Is there, is there anything to a seven year period? I'm sorry? Is there anything to the idea of a seven year period at the end? No, 
Okay. No. Uh, and and we can discuss that more, but but the short answer is no. Uh, they get that based on Daniel's 70th week. Uh, so the the 70 weeks of Daniel, a 49 year 490 year period. That's kind of one of my obsessions, right? When I was applying to PhD programs, I submitted papers based on that. And and I put three videos on YouTube on the 490 years, which I think are still the most technical ones on YouTube. Uh, but, but the short answer is John seems to think that in terms of the final seven years, that Jesus has been crucified right in the middle of that. And then the remaining three and a half years cover the entire church age. So it's very, very different than what we're used to being taught. Okay, we want to remember, because this is a very important moment in the book, you screw this up, you'll screw up lots of things. That when John hears something, and then he sees something, it's the same thing. Even if it's opposite language. In fact, it's usually opposite language. He did not see a lion in the tribe of Judah. He heard about it. And then he turns and looks and sees a lamb. So the lion and the lamb are the same thing. And one of the elders said to me, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. There is our violent language. So that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes. Well, what is going on here? Well, the word conquest, the meaning of it, is being turned on its head. This is a key vocabulary term in this book. The militaristic expectation of a conquering lion messiah has been reinterpreted due to the crucifixion of the sacrificial lamb messiah. In other words, the Jewish people were waiting for the lion messiah to come and kill his enemies. But instead, he came and conquered by letting his enemies kill him. And that's what it means to conquer in this book. And that is what it's being told to the church when they're told to conquer. The call to conquest in Revelation is not a call to arms. It is a call for the church to lay down its arms and accept its vulnerability and suffering and potential death on behalf of the gospel the way that Jesus did. So when the seven churches are told to conquer, you filter that through this verse. Conquest has been redefined as letting enemies kill us for the sake of the gospel as opposed to killing them. We share in the conquest of Jesus by sharing in his sufferings. And this is a, an idea that has deep roots in the New Testament. Remember what Paul says in Colossians that uh, Jesus triumphed over the powers when he was on the cross or what he says in first Corinthians 2 8 that had the powers of darkness known what they were doing they wouldn't have killed the Messiah they didn't realize that this was his measure his way of winning winning the war so revelation is kind of predicated on this idea that we defeat the beast empire and we defeat the powers of darkness when we lay down our lives not with violent conflict but by witnessing to the truth and accepting the consequences. So is this the right timing to bring up the question, tell me the difference between a Messianic Jew and the Christian faith and the Jewish faith. I, there's a Messianic uh, regular meeting on Saturday mornings in my old church in Deerfield, and I've attended it. And also that I've been in other settings where Messianic rabbis come in and I've been exposed to a lot and I still can't understand and sure. can you help me with that sure yeah so when I was kind of cutting my teeth as a Christian I actually had yes, a, repeat the question please. Okay. The, the the difference between Judaism Messianic Judaism and Christianity essentially mm -hmm. So when, when I was cutting my teeth as a Christian, I was actually kind of being groomed by a Messianic rabbi uh, who taught on God's learning channel. So, I, so yeah, I, I do know a lot about this and have a lot to say about it. But let me come back to that in the Q&A if I can. Very quickly, Jesus is called 
the root of David. This is a change to the language in Isaiah. Remember that when uh, John changes Old Testament language, that is significant. It's a way of saying, pay attention. I just changed the text for a reason. Well, in Isaiah chapter 11, we find that the tree that represents the line of kings in Israel has been cut down and reduced to a stump. But this is not the end. God will start new by having a branch grow out of this stump, which eventuates with the Messiah. Um, I don't need to chase this rabbit, but if you understand this, then the crazy, crazy gene genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke will suddenly make sense. Maybe we'll do that one another time. But for John, it's not the branch, but the roots. Even though Jesus is a descendant of David, he just told us that. He's from the tribe of Judah. But he wants to emphasize that he's the roots. Why is he doing this? Well, because of the divine pre-existence of Christ. He wants you to know that he's not simply a Davidic descendant. He's, in fact, prior to the house of David. Because he's divine. He's the one, the source of the house of David in the first place. So he's not just a descendant. He's the roots of the whole line. Lamb standing as though it had been slaughtered. Standing is kind of a, a, conch, a, a technical term in this book. Standing because he conquered death through resurrection. Uh, later, we will see a group of people standing with the lamb. They are likely also martyrs who have conquered and attained resurrection. Now, the lamb imagery comes from a number of places, two most significant for our purposes. The Passover lamb in Exodus, where a lamb is slaughtered for each household. The blood should be assigned for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and mark this line, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So if you have the blood of the lamb, you're not simply spared from the second death from the lake of fire. You're spared from the plagues, which is why you don't have to leave the earth in order to be saved from the plagues. And it's interesting that this word for slaughter uh, in relationship to Jesus occurs four times uh, because he's slaughtered for the whole world. Four is the number of the whole world. And then Isaiah 53, the other context where the Messiah is compared to a lamb, and as we have been saying, he's nonviolent, but he dies at the hands of the violent. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open up his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Are there <clears throat> any other times between Egypt and the very end times when God pours out plagues. Yes. <laughs> okay, before you go on to plagues, as in COVID. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the plagues in this book are interesting because they are sent specifically on persecutors of the church. And, and this, is, this is very debatable, but to some degree, uh, the church appears to be spared. Now, the exact historical expression of these plagues is, is going to be, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later, but the exact historical expression is going to be hard to put our finger on. But we know, at least here on the level of narrative, these are not indiscriminate plagues. These are discriminate plagues. They target the beast and his empire, and they spare the church. So uh, one would have to uh, analyze the degree to which COVID uh, spared or especially inflicted the church and its persecutors to make that judgment. Biological warfare. Right. Okay, thank you. Perhaps. It says that the, the, the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This imagery comes from seven eyes on a stone in the book of Zechariah. On one stone are seven eyes, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. So the stone is associated with the forgiveness of sin. But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line. 
in the hand of Zerubbabel, these are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. So the eyes of Christ here represent his omniscience, how he sees all things. As Smalley says, the spirit has been described so far in Revelation as being with God in front of the throne. Now, as a result of the exaltation of the Lamb, the spirit paraclete is sent out into God's world. And one thing that might occasion confusion is sometimes the Holy Spirit is referred to as the seven spirits. We discussed that in a previous lesson. And sometimes he's referred to as a spirit singular. Well, is there a difference? Well, Richard Bauckham says that there is. He says this, when the spirit is mentioned in the singular, God is speaking through the prophet to the church. But when the spirit is mentioned as the seven spirits, then the witness of Jesus and his church to the believing world is in view. Singular spirit, message for the church. Seven spirits, message through the church to the world. The church participates in the vocation of prophecy when we faithfully witness to the world. There are four references to the seven spirits because they represent God speaking to the whole world. Again, four is the number of universality. So these seven spirits are going to occur four times. There are 14 references to spirit singular, right? The number of God speaking to the church because it's Christ's number, seven, multiplied by the number of witness, two. We'll find out in chapter 19. It will tell us plainly that uh, the witness of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. The word lamb referring to Christ occurs 28 times, seven times four. The seven times four occurrences of lamb indicate his worldwide scope of his complete victory. Seven, Christ number four, universality. Seven of these are in phrases coupling God and the lamb together, likely to indicate his divinity. There is an interchangeability of symbols in Revelation that's pretty interesting. We have the spirit, which is represented by the seven flames of the menorah. We have the spirit, which is represented by these eyes. And we have the spirit that is responsible for prophetic visions. We have a scene in the Old Testament where all of these get used together in a negative sense. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Remember, Samuel is just a boy. He's taken to work at the tabernacle. Eli is the high priest. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. Not many visions, weak eyes, lamp in danger of going out. But in Revelation, you don't get, you know, Eli was a very troubled high priest, but we've just met Jesus as high priest and the sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. And what do we have instead? We have the lampstand brightly burning before the throne. We have eyes that are not weakening, but go to and fro throughout the whole world. And Visions are not rare, but rather we get the capstone vision of the whole prophetic tradition, John's apocalypse. It's so fascinating. The verb horao, the, the verb to see, is used exactly 70 times in Revelation. In 50 times, it's used of John when he says, I saw this or I saw that. And 50 is the number of the Holy Spirit because of Pentecost. Remember, it's 50 days after Passover. The Spirit is poured out at Pentecost. John will tell us multiple times that he sees all this through the Spirit, and he sees 50 times the number of the outpouring of the Spirit. The Lamb has seven horns. This is interesting because the beast has ten horns, and horns represent power. And there is a contrast of different types of power taking place in Revelation. And it's the power of political power versus the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So the power of the beast is his kings. In chapter 17, it will say the ten horns of the beast, which you saw are ten, ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. But the text in Zechariah that has kind of been controlling this whole presentation of the spirit contrasts the spirit over against political power, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And the context in Zechariah is that those who are returning from exile, they have God's spirit assisting them, but their opponents have the Persian Empire. And there's something to be said here about Christians who depend too strongly on political processes, political parties, and political candidates, and not enough on spirit-filled activities like witnessing and serving from a position of vulnerability. I can't tell you how many times I've seen Christians who mix their faith and their politics to such an extent that they think one of their principal vocations is to participate in a nasty political argument and as long as we get some kind of victory at the Supreme Court or in the White House or something, they think they've really paid a service to God. And what's so fascinating about this is had Jesus presented us with a kingdom based on political processes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees would have accepted him. Right? The whole thing that distinguishes Jesus's kingdom from the kingdoms of the world is it's not rooted in political power. When he is standing there arguing with Pontius Pilate, the representative of the kingdom of Rome in Judea, he tells him, in order to make this very distinction, my kingdom is not from this world. And if it were, my disciples would be fighting. Right? Non-political kingdom rooted in processes and methods that are born of the spirit and not political power. When Christians try so hard to harness political power, they're taking a hold of the method of the beast. His horns represent political power. Christians, like the lamb, are supposed through the power of the spirit to get by in God's world from a standpoint of vulnerability, from love and service and prayer, and all the gifts of the spirit that enable the church to fulfill its vocation. Okay, so now this year is a very important year, right? This election year. And what you're saying right here doesn't, it just doesn't work with what's going on in the world at all. <laughs> notice that you're young so i've noticed that yeah i i don't uh elections don't really move me uh because i cast my vote for king jesus okay do you, that's not my business as far as who you vote for but what i'm trying to say is there's just no interfacing that seems real between our world and the world that jesus represents yeah and that's that's precisely the difficulty because his kingdom is not supposed to be interlocked with the kingdoms of this world. But right? we're supposed to do what, what we're supposed to be an extension of Jesus and his work. Right, which is not political. Right. Right. Okay. So how do we fix this? Fix what? Everything. <laughs> I mean, really. It's not our problem. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's so fascinating. In the Sermon on the Mount, it's divided into two halves. And Right in the half is the Lord's Prayer. And right in the center of that is the line, uh, your will be done on earth as in heaven, as an extension of the line, your kingdom come. God's kingdom is manifested by doing all those things in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the method. And this is in, an alternative to the kingdoms of the world that get by on the basis of political power. Right? I, I just, I'm... Christians seem to be confused about the methods of this kingdom. And Revelation is a great place to stop along the way and take a look. It's God's spirit versus political power. Whose method do you care to use? That of the lamb or the beast? A lot of hospitals, children's homes, long-term care facilities, you know, came out of churches yep. and are still under 
the Lutheran home or the Lutheran children or the Methodist children or the Lutheran General Hospital, you know. Is that more of what you're we're looking for, that type of servant for the disenfranchised as opposed well, to- Yeah, yeah, as opposed, to, as opposed to partisan politics, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the, this is, it, it's so fascinating. We have a text from the pagan period in Rome where the emperor, Julian, who made it his business to try to stamp out Christianity, uh, he's complaining that Christianity is spreading. And why is it spreading? Well, because the churches are taking care, not just of their sick, but ours. And he says that, and he's not trying to give us credit at all, but he says that, you know, when, when the plague comes and everybody else runs for the hills, Christians are staying behind and taking care of the sick, risking contracting the plague for themselves, even to take care of these pagan sick. Uh, that's how the church spread. Right? There's, a, there's a popular mythology that we spread by the sword. That's not true. We spread in such ways per the testimony of a pagan emperor. Does that cover um, my favorite person? I'm very tired, but I can't think of her name. The hospital, St. Teresa. She was Catholic. That's sure. the thing. So that's why I have a problem with our Christian religions. There, it, there's a basic theme, but there's diversity within it. So that becomes political too. How so? Well, Catholics are different than evangelical Christians. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't, when I use the word political, I don't mean sectarian as though they're different groups. I'm talking about governments. Uh, diversity and disagreement within the church is just part of the mess. We can see in Galatians that Paul and Peter can't get along. <laughs> We see in Acts 5 that there's already racism in the church, that uh, Hellenistic widows are being discriminated against so that Jewish widows could be fed better. Uh, I think part of the miracle of the church is that it's been a mess since the first century, and God works in and through us despite the mess, right? Uh, the people that God has called to rescue the world are contributors to its problems, and that's just the paradox of faith. Okay, this second section should not take us as long, ma'am. I have a quick question. Um, I grew up a long time ago uh, in church that basically said that um, don't don't do anything that's political um, because that's that's not Christians. Just ignore that. And so most of the people who I know my who are about my age. They do nothing. So that meant don't run for mayor, don't run for school board, don't don't go out and try to do what's right as a Christian, correcting wrong. I'm not saying politics. I'm saying sure. get involved in your local school board, get involved Damn. in this and that. And we were told as back in the day that no, no, you have nothing to do with that. We're just here to save people. And and now we realize that because Christians did not get involved in things, that only evil things started becoming part of our culture or whatever. So I'm not saying, hey, go out and, and pick it or go out and and you know be against somebody or whatever, but but to so my question to you, are you saying that we should take that step back again sure. and have nothing yeah. to do with those things because it, otherwise yeah. there's no right to the wrong that's yeah. Yeah. being yeah. done out there in school boards and in in races and, and you know. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'd, I'd say two things, right? It's, it's a big topic, but I'd say two things. One, since the rise of the political right and since the evangelicals became a major political force in the 1980s, the country has not improved. So. Uh, I don't subscribe to the notion that it's really helped. The second thing I'd say is that political, uh, very uh, various Christian groups who have said we need to pump the brake a little bit on our political involvement, especially on like identity politics and making politics a part of our identity, uh, they have prescribed different measures of involvement in the political system. Some will say that we can fully participate, but there are a few basic things that we should avoid, such as killing people in war or participating uh, 
uh, in any kind of act activities that would blatantly violate um, uh, principles of the gospel. And others have opted to completely wash their hands and step away from it. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care if a person has level two or level eight involvement, so long as they start at a place where they recognize the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men, that the kingdoms of men are inherently fallen, and that they are demonic entities, right? Revelation has taught that. It'll teach it again. Luke teaches that. Deuteronomy teaches that. Daniel teaches that. It seems to me that based on America's notion of manifest destiny, that America is a special nation chosen by God and this and that, there's all sorts of remnants of that in our Christian culture that people have uh, espoused an unbiblical notion that the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men, or specifically the kingdom of America, walk arm in arm, and that they're meant to be pals. But listen, the prophetic destiny of every country is to be destroyed at the second coming of Jesus. Okay. And so, so I would, I would like, I would like very much that that Christians, whatever they think is. Uh, the right amount of involvement in politics to understand that this is at best a secondary method for Christians and there has to be a line of distinction uh, between their allegiance to the kingdom of God and their participation in the kingdoms of the world. Okay, so then, I mean, I'm sorry. These are very interesting, very good. All of it's good. So you just have to extend your class so I have so many questions, but I don't mean by length of time of the class, but keep going for months and months. But Israel, okay, United Nations. I mean, what 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 can you say about that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, because those are my favorite subjects. Can I United answer maybe both of these questions? <laughs> can you what? Jesus already gave us the answer. He said, "Give to God what is God's, and give to Caesar what is Caesar." Yeah, you which is don't in, pay your taxes, right? Of course, just live yeah. in the political world. Well, no, no, he's don't forget about the Christian. No, world. he's insulting Caesar when he says that. Well, so so could be. Well, well, no, well, let me explain it. All right, so he says to look at the inscription and the image upon the coin. Now, Jewish people were offended by the coins because they had an image of Caesar in it in a superscription that said he was the son of God. And because of this, people wondered all the time, should we use Caesar's coins? Because it's a little idol, right? Mm. And so when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's, what he is saying is this coin is made in Caesar's image. Give that to him. But you are made in God's image. You belong to God and not to Caesar, right? This is not a statement about just getting along with the government and doing whatever they say. Now, Minimal involvement is paying your taxes and praying for the emperor. Political options were abundant in the ancient world through the patronage system, right? Through patronage and, and clients. There were political options available, and the New Testament prescribes none of these. <clears throat> paying taxes is the minimum. And I think a lot of Christians, especially have grown up in the United States under an implicit manifest destiny, they find passages saying that you should uh, pay your taxes and they think this is an endorsement of political methods. But the early church never read it that way. And why would you? Like All right. <laughs> like so... Uh, Okay, I'll say this, because we probably don't have time to finish the lesson now. Uh, the grind between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of the world, and the difficulty we have in having to live within the world and having to live in its nation states, yet also giving our ultimate allegiance to the kingdom of God, is a conversation that is not unique to Revelation. It's taking place in every New Testament book, right? When Jesus says, uh, you know, John the Baptist is the best man ever born, right? And he's the opposite of who? Those who live in palaces and wear soft clothing. He says this. Or when he says in, in Mark chapter 10 that, well, you see the rulers of the Gentiles. He's talking about the politicians. And, you, and he uses an interesting word in Greek that is often suppressed in the translation. He said, those who seem to be rulers. Like he doesn't even want to acknowledge them. And then, of course, Rome, 
brought kingdom power and truth to the world according uh, to their evangelion, the gospel that they proclaimed, because Rome did claim, did preach an evangelion. And so when the early Christians come and they proclaim an evangelion, they're saying this is the alternative gospel, different than Rome's, right? It's not a religious word detached from a political context. And what we find in the conversation between Caesar and Jesus is, excuse me, uh, Pilate and Jesus, is that the governor, this Roman representative, he doesn't know anything about kingdom, power, or truth. Jesus wins the argument. Don't buy Mel Gibson's movie where Jesus and Pilate are pals. That is an argument, and the representative of that kingdom fails, and Jesus wins. Now, in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, when Satan shows up and he says, all the kingdoms of the world are in my control, and I'll give them to whoever I like. Fall down and worship me, and I'll make this happen for you. That would have made sense to an ancient Jew or an ancient Christian who'd read Daniel 10, where the great kingdoms of the world are under fallen angels who are fighting against God's angels, right? So uh, in, in the way that Paul talks about the noble and those who, who participate in government in 1 Corinthians 2, the way he tells Christians to stay out of their courtrooms in 1 Corinthians 6, and the way in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says that Jesus must reign and rule until he puts all principalities and powers under his feet, he uses Greek terms there that refer to governments, right? I think that many people just have never had exposure to the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of the world that pervade the New Testament. And it should be no surprise. All of the primary messianic texts, whether it be Psalm 110, Psalm 102, uh, Daniel 7, they are all pitting the kingdom of God against the nations of the world. And if your understanding of Christianity has not internalized this tension, it is yet to be fully biblical because this is running throughout Genesis to Revelation. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The Ten Commandments. Okay. Ten Commandments should be in every single church, temple, whatever, and let the rest of it go bye-bye and keep it simple. Ten All right. Do you think the church in this country is weaker than it should be because it's relied too much on intellectualism and not enough on the other gifts of the spirit? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, Christianity in the United States is more anti-intellectual than Christianity has ever been in its history. I think anti-intellectualism is killing us because we're sending kids to college who have first grade theology and they're running into college level skepticism and they're leaving the faith. So I don't think that's the problem. Uh, what about the gifts of the spirit in yeah, the church? Yeah. What do you mean? They're not fully utilized in most churches in this country. You have a lot of gifts that aren't really taught or highly practiced. Healing, tongues, oh, okay. laying on hands, um, the more spiritual type things than intellectual. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I would default to 1 Corinthians 15, 13, where after Paul has mentioned all these gifts, including things like tongues and healing, etc., uh, he says that all of these pale in comparison to the three gifts that matter the most, right? Uh, faith, hope, and love. Uh, so the church may be out of balance sometimes in its neglect of certain gifts, but I think as long as we keep those three as our centerpiece, we'll do we'll do pretty well, sir. So uh, in your email to us talking about tonight and how we're going to get through chapter nine, you said that it, it's going to be a, a new way that uh, Jesus is going to be worshipped or that we worship him, something to that effect. Are we going to get to that next week? Or Probably, we? yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and what, what I... 513, oh, yeah. heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and up the sea, and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne of the land, praise, honor, forever and ever, the four living creatures that fell down. And then Philippians 2, 10 through 11, every knee shall bow, every tongue right. confess. Right. Uh, uh, so... Yeah, uh, I, I want to hear more about that. We would. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's a it's a forced submission. 
okay. uh, just like in the Philippians text. In fact, that's where people usually go there. Other people have taken that as a, a sign of universalism. That's actually supposed to be part of this lesson, but we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Okay, I'll close this in prayer. Can I encourage you a first question? I sit in the same room Saturday morning for a Bible study, 7 o'clock. We usually only cover one verse every week. <laughs> Not one chapter, one verse. Dude, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that out loud because I've been a little self-conscious about how slow it's moving. You're rocking and I'm it, like, man. oh, these, like these, these, these poor people are sitting through this long, long study. But this is actually the fastest I've ever done it. So, uh, <laughs> one strong question. Who's the person who helps you pick up your wardrobe? <laughs> I have no helper. <laughs> I can tell, right? This is the busy character, people. Okay, this is the busy character. like the Kermit the Frog One of those mysterious spirits. Yeah, well, well, wait a minute. Christian, we, we, I'll be honest. Is that a spider on the bottom, or what is that? Uh, this is a Disney musical from the early 1990s. You shouldn't encourage that, though. Lucy. Oh, man. He wants Christmas. I, he wants, he, yeah, it was he a tried Christmas. to give well, Christmas to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Is That's that Christmas? awesome compared to that sick yeah. bird on his computer. I know. I know. Well, this is this is the. the oh, this was a plague a doctor. doctor. So so in, in my PhD, I'm supposed to become the plague doctor because my PhD is on the plagues. And so uh, these little trinkets were bought, or plague doctor was put on various things. But, uh, and those hospitals that you say have started out as Christian are not Christian now, by the way. They have that name. They profess it, but they don't. Their business. All right. All right, I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you for this group. Thank you for good questions. Um, um, thank you that we're challenged by this content. I pray that uh, we would be open to the challenge instead of just assuming whatever we brought into this room is right. That's the it goes for me too. Uh, and I pray that, uh, you know, if we, if we learn the book of Revelation on the information level, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, even if it just calls us to better ethics, that is not complete. The point of this book is to teach us how to see the world with prophetic eyes, and especially how to see its kingdoms with prophetic eyes, chapter after chapter. And uh, uh, it's difficult, and John will admit it's difficult in chapter 13, but I pray that you would just enable us to accept the difficulty and to allow some of our assumptions to be challenged as we move ahead. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.